Our second scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Listen again for God's word. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to, to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the, promise of the whole, for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I found myself doing something I don't frequently do this week. I was looking through a dictionary, and I felt compelled to look up a particular word that just sort of seemed to be sitting with me. I looked up the word disorientation, and here's what I found. I found two definitions. One, a loss of one's sense of direction, position, or relationship with one's surrounding. And the second, a temporary or permanent state of confusion regarding place, time, or personal identity. A loss of a sense of direction, a state of confusion. I don't know about you, but these definitions really hit home for me. And it struck me that disorientation feels about right for how I might describe the season that we're in. I think many of us feel a sense of having lost our understanding of where we stand in the world and how we are to interact in the world. In these days of rapidly changing guidelines regarding masks and social distancing and how to care for ourselves while still caring for our neighbors in a pandemic that is actually not over yet, we're just in a different phase, making decisions can seem more confusing than ever. Is it safe to travel? Can I hug my friend who I haven't seen in person for over a year? What will the next school year look like? We are adjusting to a new normal with the understanding that that normal could still change at any moment. It may be quite a while before some of us stop automatically backing up six feet from the next person in front of us in line and some simply do not feel comfortable in crowds anymore. Those of us like myself, who, is all, who have always identified as extroverts, suddenly find that we have become quite the homebody over the last year and a half, and things that used to fill us with joy, like spending an evening in a crowded restaurant, or in a movie theater, or going to a music festival, now fills us with an underlying sense of dread and a little bit of fear. And others, who may have always longed for a slower pace with fewer social engagements, may suddenly find themselves yearning for a calendar with a little bit more on it. Meanwhile, the news continues to bombard us with upheaval. There's violence in Israel and Palestine. 
There's political turmoil. There's a gas shortage. Not to mention the personal griefs and transitions that we face in our own lives. It feels like the whole world is in a state of disorientation. Well, if nothing else, our passage in Acts today gives me a little comfort by pointing out that there was real disorientation for Jesus' disciples, too. We are not the first ones to feel this way. Where Luke ended his gospel and begins this additional book of Acts, he begins in a time of disorientation, if ever there was one. After all, Jesus had died, and his friends and followers had been plunged into grief. And as if that weren't enough to throw them off their axis, then Jesus has risen from the dead. He met his disciples in the garden, walking along the road and in the room where they were locked away afraid. He talked with them, and he ate with them, and he let them touch his wounded hands and his side. And then... The piece de resistance, the last scene in Luke's gospel and the first scene in the book of Acts, is one that would likely make any of us feel disoriented. According to Acts, Jesus went to Jerusalem with his friends and was there and gave them a surprising instruction. Don't do anything drastic. Wait for the spirit that you have been promised. It won't be long. And then, before their very eyes, Jesus was lifted up into the clouds and out of their sight. Is it any wonder that they stood there slack-jawed and wondering what on earth they were supposed to do then? I would be. Talk about disorienting. And in an instant, some things were back to the way they had been, but also everything had changed. And in the midst of their confusion and wonder, two men in white robes appeared to them. Now Luke's readers and us last encountered two messengers in bright robes at Jesus' empty tomb. There, they asked the women who came to anoint Jesus' body, why do you look for the living among the dead? And here, at another turning point, and place of departure for Jesus' disciples, the heavenly messengers once again ask a question to shift the disciples' focus. Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? It's as if there must be some purpose beyond and within the disorientation, something that needs the disciples' attention here and now in flesh and blood. The situation was disorienting for the disciples in ways beyond Jesus' wondrous departure into the clouds. We are told in verse 3 that Jesus had been spending his time with the disciples post-Easter, continuing much of what his earthly ministry focused on, teaching about the kingdom of God. So this is still very much on the minds of his disciples as they make this final journey together with Jesus. Given this... And given Jesus' great victory over all that sought to end his life, it makes sense that there was some big expectations that Jesus was going to make a really big move next. That messianic expectation that in some way God's Messiah would usher in the new rise of Israel and restore self-determination to God's people. That, That desire ran deep. And this seemed like as good a time as any. I mean, Jesus had come back from the grave and was now about to ascend to the heavens. Surely this was the time. Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? The disciples ask. But true to form, Jesus' answer is unexpected. Jesus always seems to be somewhere other than where he is supposed to be, Barbara Lundblad wrote. He was supposed to be in the grave, but instead he was with his disciples. He was supposed to be working toward political liberation, but instead he was reminding them of the promise of the spirit that would come to them. He meets their question with a surprising response, saying, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. 
Jesus tries to refocus their attention away from the questions of when and more to the question of how. God's kingdom is here, but they cannot know the timing of God's final victory. And so it is a waste for them to speculate about that. Instead, they'll have a part to play in the meantime, and that will be enabled through the Holy Spirit's power. And then after Jesus ascends into heaven, the men in white offer a similar reorientation to the bewildered disciples. It's no use standing around looking up. Jesus will come back, but you don't need to be concerned about when. Instead, go about doing what Jesus instructed. So what was that instruction? To our ears, what the disciples were commanded to do may sound surprising at first, They were told to wait. I preach, and when I preach, I seem to talk a lot about waiting, given the times of the church year that I find myself in the pulpit or the state of our world, but here we are again. The disciples are told to wait. Jesus instructed them to go back to Jerusalem and wait there for the Holy Spirit to be given to them. And then, had, they were to be his witnesses. Waiting and witnessing. That is the instruction for the meantime, while they waited on God's timing. If we read further in the first chapter of Acts, we get a glimpse of what this waiting looked like, and it was not empty time. As I've said before, waiting does not mean just being passive. This time was filled with preparation and prayer. Jesus left the earth, and the same spirit that had been at work in him would be at work within all who follow him but they had to wait. And so while they waited, the disciples remained faithful to what they knew to do. They prayed and they tended to the needs of their community. They did what they needed to do in order to be open to the Holy Spirit's coming, knowing that they could not make that happen themselves. Acts scholar Matthew Skinner notes, we may find the waiting at the beginning of Acts easy to skip over, as a brief narrative hesitation to build suspense for the eventual coming of the Holy Spirit during the Jewish festival of Pentecost. At pa- of Pentecost. Yet the interval conveys an important lesson about how God will interact with these people. Presumably, the Holy Spirit could have come immediately after Jesus' ascension, but God waits a little more than a week's time. And the waiting held a lesson for the disciples as it does for It reminds us of our dependence on God and the limitations of our ability to see and know God, Skinner writes. This time of waiting was a time to practice dependence on God. We are to practice dependence on God and to discern the Spirit's movement when it arrives. The disciples' very disorientation was used by a God who has a habit of showing up in unexpected places to reorient them to the heavenly kingdom's arrival in earthly time and space. Now, in his instructions, Jesus didn't let the disciples off the hook with the command to endlessly wait. He went on to describe what would happen when the promised Holy Spirit came. His disciples were to be witnesses. Now, true confession, I have often found this story of the ascension to just be strange. I never quite understood why Jesus had to be lifted up into heaven. What, what, what does that mean? Well, it turns out, I think, that this command to witness might hold a key for us. Scholar Catherine Grebe makes the point that so long as Jesus was physically present, he was available only to those he encountered. By the Spirit, he became powerfully present to many through his prophetic successors. Jesus' disciples were told that they would have a part to play in God's ongoing work to redeem all of creation. Through their witness, others would come to know the good news that the promised reign of God had arrived in Jesus Christ. And they were not just witnesses because they personally knew Jesus. They would be empowered to be witnesses because they would have the presence of the Holy Spirit with them. 
one of my favorite scholars, Dr. Willie James Jennings, points this out, writing that they would be witnesses of divine presence. They will give room to the witness, making their lives a stage on which the resurrected Jesus will appear and claim each creature as his own, as a site of love and desire. In other words, the disciples would bear witness to the divine presence not only by their words, but by their very lives. And they could not do this kind of witnessing under their own steam. They had to wait on the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit did come, as we'll talk about more next week. The Holy Spirit has come, friends. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus promised at his ascension, empowers an active witness here and now, not just passive waiting on the unknowable timing of God. We share the disciples' charge to be witnesses. One of my favorite prayers is attributed frequently to Teresa of Avila. Whether or not she actually wrote it, we not, might not know, but it's a beautiful prayer, and I think it encapsulates what this call to witness looks like. She prays, God of love, help us to remember that Christ has no body now on earth but ours, no hands but ours, no feet but ours. Ours are the eyes to see the needs of the world. Ours are the hands with which to bless everyone now. Ours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. We may be feeling disoriented by any number of things, but we are called to receive the Holy Spirit and then to be Christ's witnesses. At our joint session and deacons retreat a few weeks ago, we spoke about this season in our congregation's life. Programs are starting to be planned. Classes are beginning to happen in person again. The community and city that we are in is also coming back to life. And somehow there seem to be even more needs to be met now, perhaps, than there were when we closed the building's doors over a year ago. Our congregation's leadership expressed the kind of tension that I think many of us are encountering in our individual lives. We want to get back to normal, and we don't. We know that we are called to be together, to worship, to learn, and to serve, but we are wary of simply picking up where we left off over a year ago. There is a recognition that we are returning to in-person church life, but we are doing so as changed people. Things are getting back to normal, but also everything has changed. In this disorienting season, I hope that we will use the Ascension story as a mirror to help us see the invitation that Christ is issuing to us no less than he issued it to his followers in the first century. We will continue to be Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that Holy Spirit is doing new things. I thought and thought because I wanted to give you a vivid vision of what that is. But I do believe that God is up to something. And things here may not look exactly like they were before. We have new members in our community. Our city has new leadership. We have new calls to pursue healing and justice, such as that that's offered with the Ed Johnson Project. There are people to love. There are wounds to tend wrongs to be righted. We can't sit on our hands and do nothing. But this story reminds us that we also don't need to push forward with anxiety and fear. Because Christ has risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, Christ reigns. The good news that Jesus' ascension brings us is that Christ is far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, as Ephesians reminds us. Christ reigns over every season, the waiting and the witnessing. And so we can face our disorienting times with hope, with grace to wait when necessary, and with the spirit-driven power to be witnesses to our living, reigning Lord of love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>